Then, um, I have the courses, uh, the lecture recorded in pretty much whatever classes I can. Uh, I especially have them recorded in the classes um, that I teach online. Now, I don't have an online section this semester for CISS 232, but we do offer it sometimes. And uh, it's nice to have these videos uh, for the lecture. So, uh, frankly, I'd have all my classes in here if they let me, but this is a relatively scarce resource, so I can only get the ones that I can. Um, all right, so um, if you want, you are welcome to press the little button when you ask a question in front of you. That will put the camera on you and turn your mic on. No one has ever on purpose pressed that button. So far, the only people who have ever pressed that button have been people that have been moving their book around or, or gee, I wonder what this does. You know, is this the mute button where I can turn them off or whatever, all right? Uh, so I don't necessarily expect you to. Um, what I will do, what I'll try to do, and if you want to, you can even feel free to remind me, is repeat the question back. So that way, someone watching the, the video will, will hear the question and hear the response. Um, I also, um, what do I want to say uh, about that? Um, the advantage is here that if you do need to miss, you know, a class for whatever reason, you know, you're not feeling well, you're going out of town for some reason or another, or any reason, then you can wa watch the recording. And uh, I am experimenting with something a little bit different this term. I'm actually posting them to YouTube as opposed to the campus server. The hope being that that, that makes it more accessible so you can watch me on your cell phone or watch me... Uh, you know, on any device that supports YouTube. So we'll see how that goes. Um, but at any rate, that's it as far as recording goes. What I'd like to do is run through attendance real quick. Um, recognize a lot of people here, but not everyone. It's possible that the folks I do not recognize are folks I've had on an online class before. That happens a lot. I finally get to associate um, a name and a face. So let me log on to Angel, and we'll take attendance real quick. I'll spend a little bit of time going over sort of the class structure and how everything is set up in Angel, and then we'll, we'll kind of start with an overview of the main technologies that we're going to cover in this class. All right. It's the other thing this morning. I took attendance and didn't hit the save button, so that was not recorded. Um, Al Baker is here. Carol is here, right? Dennis Crawford is here. Oops. Christopher Hammond. James Huber. Don Jenkins. David Karpinski. David Klima, Klima. Uh, Matthew Ream. Pat. Jennifer Silva. Daniel Tolis. Tolis. Uh, Mark Yarnell. And your name is? Chris Hammond. Chris Hammond, all right. Okay, and I am here, and I'll click save this time. Is there anyone in class that is not familiar with Angel, the, the course management tool? All right. Um, you can ask specific questions in lab if there's something that you want to know that we haven't covered, uh, but I'll assume that you know how to log on and, and that sort of thing. Um, if you've had me in a class before, the layout of these classes are, are very similar, so um, I hope you, you won't have too much trouble navigating around. Most of the action takes place on the content tab. All right. There also is the communicate tab where you can go in and send me email or send uh, email to other people in the class, but really most of the stuff is on the content tab. Syllabus. Um, oh, we'll do sort of a, a quick run through first, and then we'll, we'll, we'll drill down and look at some of these in more, more detail. The syllabus is, uh, we'll, we'll cover in more detail in a minute here. 
Um, it really is one of the finest pieces of writing. No, I don't know. It's a syllabus. All right. Copyright for educational projects. Um, I do think it's important to respect copyright law. Um, and within an educational context, the copyright law is different than in, in the, the regular world. You know, whether, whether you're talking about even for something personal. Um, you actually, in an educational context, have a little more flexibility as far as what's called fair use. All right, tied up with copyright is the concept of fair use, right? Uh, for example, a book, this book is copyrighted, but I can buy it and read it, and I can actually lend it to someone else. That's considered fair use. Or if I was writing a review for it, I would be allowed to maybe excerpt a paragraph for it. That's considered fair use. What's not considered fair use is would be as if I went and copied the entire book and distributed it to everyone in the class. That's not considered fair use. You have a little bit more leeway with fair use in an educational context than you would in, in either a commercial or even a personal context. And this kind of overview, overviews um, uh, what the restrictions are and, and that sort of thing. So um, take the time and read that. Um, this will become relevant as you start to do pages and maybe incorporating images or, or other stuff uh, from that for, uh, uh, for your work, especially images in this class. There's a folder for the assignments. Each one has its instructions and has a Dropbox. We'll spend the last few minutes of class looking at the first assignment. I have a resource folder that really compared to the 216 class is kind of puny. I have hundreds of, or dozens anyhow, of resources in my 216 class. Really I only have a few here. Um, and if you find anything good, let me know and I'll, I'll post it to um, this folder. Lastly, there's a discussion forum um, to, to feel free to, to ask questions uh, between class. Um, the way I would differentiate it uh, is, you know, you can send me an email or you can post a discussion forum. Consider posting to the discussion forum like raising your hand in class. You know, in other words, you have a question that you think other people would benefit from hearing the answer. All right. Think of, of sending an email as like grabbing me in lab and, and asking me a question in lab like why doesn't this code work or something like that. All right. uh, so if you think it relates just to you, um, you know, send it as an email. If, if, you, if, you, if you think that the whole class will benefit from it, then, then post it. There's no penalty either way. I mean, it is okay, you know, you, if you get it wrong and send it one place where I thought, well, that would be better to post to them. It's not like there's any, any issue there. But I'm just sort of giving you a guideline of how, how you, I usually look at, at those things. The point is, though, is ask. All right, if you have questions, ask. I urge you to, to uh, check, on your, uh, check on Angel between classes. And this is a way for you to communicate uh, with you. Uh, I, I, my goal is usually to respond to emails within at least a day. And um, some, a lot of times I do better than that. Um, on occasion I will not do quite that well. But usually within a day or a couple days uh, you'll get a response uh, either to a discussion posting or that. The important thing is to ask. It's better to, to communicate either the message board or email than to send me a voicemail message. Because I don't check voicemail messages as often as I check email messages. I check voicemail messages when I'm on campus. I check email messages constantly. All right, so it's better to send me messages via email. All right, let's look at the syllabus. I'm not going to deprive you the pleasure of reading this syllabus. But I do want to point out a few things um, in it. Standard stuff, a list of ways to get a hold of me. Either email through Angel or this email uh, will work. Really doesn't matter one way or another. Here are my office hours. Um, if those office hours don't work for you, you have a couple of alternatives. One is you're welcome to sit in on any other lab that I teach the class for. All right? You're welcome to sit in on their lab session and ask me questions. For the most part, my lab sessions are pretty open. We usually don't have any organized activities. People are just working on their stuff. Uh, in which case, you know, you're welcome to come in to my other labs. Um, I have uh, two day and two evening classes, this being one of the evening classes. I also have a Tuesday and Thursday one 
um, that goes from, uh, the lab goes from 9 to 10 p.m., so it's kind of late. My day labs are, let's see, Monday and Wednesday, 10 to 11, and Tuesday and Thursday, about 11.30 to 1 or so. All right. So I've been doing that the past few semesters. Uh, I started largely for my online students, but I, I think campus students benefit from that as well. The point is, is if you need to see me or talk to me about it, there's a lot of ways to get a hold of me and, and pick the one that works for you. All right, talk to me in lab, see me during office hours, come to another lab, or we can exchange via email. A lot of issues can be handled via email, and again, I do check between classes, but again, some issues it's best to talk face-to-face -face about, you know. And that's one thing that, that I hope to use uh, in the lab this time is to, um, you know, check and see what you're doing and, and sort of give you uh, um, some advice uh, in, in the lab. Maybe be a little more proactive about that if I notice you're having trouble about that. Office hours are effective actually week two. All right. Uh, so they're not really in effect this week. I kind of like that. I use that as my way of easing into the semester. All right. I know a lot of other folks start, start with their office hours right the first day. You know, I don't want to shock my system too much. So I kind of very gradually, I, I teach my classes, I go home and nap, and then I come back and teach my next class. All right? I'll continue to do that the rest of the semester, except there'll be office hours <laughs> between the, before the nap. All right. These are all, this is a formal description of what we're, we're studying in this class. And um, this ought to go beyond just nice, pleasant words, you know, stuff that we put in the catalog. This really, um, these things are the, the, the reason that we're here. This is what we want uh, you to get out of this class. So do read through those and make sure that you understand what we're talking about, how it applies to these things. You know, it's not always easy to tell that, you know, as, as we're going around and we're looking at certain things, it's not always easy to tell um, what we're talking about, how it relates to our end goals. Um, and if it's not clear, um, then you should ask me, you know, what does this have to do with anything, you know? And maybe it doesn't. Maybe I'm just, you know, I, I just woke up from my nap and I'm talking nonsense for the first 15 minutes of class. That would be a good way to sort of shock me into reality, all right, and get me back uh, on task. So you're welcome to ask me, you know, what does that have to do with anything if what I'm talking about isn't clear. The text that we're using, um, the storage media, uh, again, anyone that's worked in the labs here realizes that you have to take a copy of your stuff with you, so having a thumb drive or emailing it to yourself or something along those lines is necessary. Instructor approach, uh, you know, I suppose this is the gist of it. The rest of it's elaboration, <laughs> all right? This is your class. Uh, me and another instructor would always joke, you know, did you cover such and such topic? And he'd joke and say, well, yeah, I covered it. You know, whether the students got it or not, I have no idea, right? Uh, it shouldn't be that way, you know, and then we said that jokingly. This is your class. My job is to make sure that, that the material that we go over, you understand. It doesn't do anyone good, uh, any good, if I can check something off the list and say, yeah, we covered it. We talked about it. Well, if half the class has no clue what I'm talking about, then that really doesn't matter. I really, no good was accomplished. So therefore, ask questions. Let me be the judge if the question um, is best asked in class or, or the lab. I, I have some students that will tell me sometimes like, gee, you know, I'm totally lost and, and you know, I, I listen to what you're saying, but I have no idea what you're talking about. It's like, well, ask me. You know, raise your hand and ask me. Well, I was, you know, let me be the judge if I think it's, if, it, if it's worthwhile for the whole class to, to, to hear the explanation or if we want to talk about it in lab. You know, either way is fine, you know. But, so, so ask the question if, you, if you're having trouble understanding something. And then I'll, I'll make the, the call whether we talk about it immediately or whether we wait to, to, to get the lab to talk about it. There's a good chance. A, a great teacher cliche is that for every student that, uh, you know, has a question or asks a question, there's, there's other students that also don't understand the material and could ask the same question. So, you know, we have a relatively small class here. Uh, if even two or three people don't understand something, that's a significant percentage of the people. And for the people that do understand it, it might do them good to review it. So don't be shy at all about asking questions. 
One other thing I use Angel for is posting announcements between class. And announcements can be anything um, on the order of, you know, here's the answers for the upcoming quiz. Just kidding. Just want to make sure, you know, try to plant that idea in your head. Uh, this is a good idea to check the announcements. But, you know, things like, you know, I, I'm sick and I won't be in class today. Or what happens sometimes is a student will ask me a question or I'll run into a problem during lecture that I get stuck on, you know. I, I'm, I'm not, not perfect and sometimes I get questions that I don't know the answer to immediately. Well, what I typically do then is I go back and research it and I'll post the, the answer as soon as I have it. So. It's important to sort of check Angel for those sorts of communications along for any emails that I might send you relating to any of the assignments that you turned in. Here's a bunch of general college policies. My lay policy is very flexible, but I, I do want to make sure that we stay on task. Um, if a student is late once in a while on an exception basis, they're sick and they weren't able to get something in on time or they had to go out of town and, and therefore they weren't able to work on something, that's fine. What I'm concerned about is with the students that are continually late and again, not for the effect it has on me, but the issues that it has on them, right? If you're getting the assignments done on time, that's a good indicator that, that you're making an appropriate amount of progress. Uh, and you should be pretty comfortable, yeah, you're in pretty good shape if you're getting the assignments done and getting them done on time. Again, an exception that is explained through the external circumstances once in a while, that's no big deal. But if you're finding yourself continually being late with assignments and not being able to get things done, then that's a sign that you probably uh, need to talk to me in more detail. All right? And when we need to figure out what we can do to, to, to help you out and get you moving. The bottom line is, is I reserve the right to deduct points, but I also either reserve the right if I've been working with you and I'm aware that you're having difficulty and we're attempting to resolve it, um, I also reserve the right not to deduct points. So I let that be at my discretion. Um, if there is some personal circumstances that's keeping you from getting an assignment in time, you don't need to tell me details. Just tell me, you know, hey, something's up. You know, the assignment will be in Thursday instead of Tuesday or whatever. And that's fine. You don't have to go into details or, or you know, talk about anything that's per, uh, of a personal nature. All right. There are, you could call them tests or you can call them quizzes. There are three tests, quizzes, and uh, a bunch of homework. Um, we'll talk about the, the main sections of this class in a minute here, but in essence there's a JavaScript section, a PHP section, and an AJAX section. Um, there'll be a JavaScript quiz, a PHP quiz, and then a final exam. And the final exam, it doesn't matter what I call it, it's comprehensive because the stuff that we're doing at the end of the semester requires you to know the stuff that we've done throughout the semester. So I can say it's comprehensive, I can say it's not comprehensive, it's comprehensive, all right? And it's worth a little bit more. And then there is uh, homework assignments, not necessarily weekly. Most homework assignments will run a week to two weeks, depending on, on the size of them. So you might have about 10 assignments, give or take, throughout the semester. Here's the approximate schedule. It is flexible, so it is possible that this, will, this is subject to change just based on how the class is going. Uh, but this gives you a guide sort of, of what to read. Um, the one thing that we do is we don't really cover the, we don't completely cover the textbook sequentially. We go chapters 1 through 9, then we skip and do 14 through 17, and then we come back and do 10 through 13. Um, it's kind of a goofy order they do the, they do the book in. Um, again, I, I guess you know, it, it's okay. I guess we could do it that way, but I would prefer to cover PHP before we start talking about Ajax stuff. All right. Questions? Yes? Uh, not, not as far as assignments go or anything like that. Uh, 
if I recall correctly, it's been a while since I looked at that CD, there's just really a lot of good reference material on that CD. But it's not, it's not like a requirement, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> more to the point, if you find a copy of the book used and it doesn't have the CD, it's probably not an issue. Well, the, uh, the book's available on Safari online also. Okay. All right. That's a good point. How many of you are aware of Safari books online? All right. What it is, is there's actually a database. If you go to LC's library, And I'll say this not just for this textbook, but for, for any technical books. If you are on campus, you can access this freely. If you're off campus, I think you have to log in with your um, library card number. Not your student number, your library card number. Um, let's see. If you go under research databases, and look under S, first one on the list, Safari Books Online. What you get is you get really full text of books on a variety of topics. So, you know, let's just pick one web development. This looks interesting. 97 things a programmer should know. And this is full text of the, of the book. So this isn't just a summary or whatever. This is a, a service that we subscribe to here at LC. And our students are allowed to read it. And this is good, if, if nothing else, um, to allow you to preview books. Um, a lot of times students will ask me, you know, what's a good JavaScript book? What's a good book on such and such technology? And really, there's a lot of good books out there. And the question may be what is more in tune with your preferences and your, your style of learning. So this is a good way to um, preview a book to see if, it, if it's one that, that sort of seems suitable for you. Uh, but again, I didn't realize it, but that's a good bonus. Our textbook is available uh, on here. Uh, the problem is, again, is, is this isn't really uh, a neat um, electronic book reader you know, or anything. So uh, the interface is probably a little clunky, but again, you can, you can access inform, uh, information from this and other books. Other questions? All right. Um, those of you familiar with musicals, all right, this is effectively the overture for the class. If you think of the class as a giant musical, this today, this lecture, and, and probably a bit of Wednesday's lecture is going to be the overture. That means I'm actually going to sing the rest of the lecture. So, <clears throat> no, just kidding. What it means, it was an overture. When you go to a, a musical or whatever, what, what do they do in the overture? They play little snippets of the different themes of the main songs that, that, that they're going to play. And it sort of gives you an idea of, of what the music is going to be like and sort of an overview. And, and that's really what, what the rest of today's class is going to be. Um, we'll take, uh, there's about 25 minutes left in class. We'll probably take 20 minutes or so of the overture. Um, and the last five minutes we'll look at, at your first lab assignment. All right. Um, I assume all of you have had CISS 216, which is the intro to web development. Is that correct? Is there anyone who has not had that? Okay, you haven't, but you got the prereq waived, right? Yes. Okay, so we, we talked about it, right? So you are from, all right, that's true. Um, okay, so either you, ha you have some basic knowledge of, of web development. Um, the simplest model for a web page, the interaction between the client and the server, the simplest model is something like this. We have a client. This diagram 
is going to be burned on your eyes before the end of the class. All right, or variations of this, because I talk about this diagram a lot of different classes. The simplest scenario for a website involves a client, the internet, and a server. The internet is drawn as a cloud um, simply because from the perspective of this class, we don't really care what happens. When I make my request for a web page by going to my web browser and typing in CNN.com, somehow that request makes it to CNN's web server. We don't care how that happens in this class. You know? If you take networking classes, they probably care about how that happens. But for this class, we don't really care how that happens. We make the request and somehow it ends up in the right place and the server responds and somehow their response makes it back to us to the right place. When I talk about the client in this diagram, what am I talking about? What is a client in this context? Requester of information. Yeah. Right, a requester of information. Really that's the best definition of a client period is a client is an entity in a computer system that makes requests. A server then does what? A server responds to requests. Now in this context, we're talking about web pages. So the client is the entity that is asking for web pages. The server is the entity that is responding to these requests and supplying those web pages. What, the, what is, what is a, an example of a client in, in sort of a web? context. What's the client look like? What name does the client go by? Pardon me? They're a user. They're a person. They're a person running what kind of software? A web browser. Okay. So typically the standard in the standard model here, this is someone sitting connected to the internet running a web browser. Now we know that that definition sort of has expanded over time, right? That now includes people that are using their phones to browse the internet or people using their PS3 or their Nintendo DS or whatever, all right? Or their I iPad or whatever. But the client is someone who's running a web browser that's making requests through the internet to a web server. And the web server is the system that's responding to those requests. Now in the CISS 216 class in the Intro to Web Development, we talked about static web pages. All right? And, and static means unchanging. In the case of web pages, it means that it doesn't change unless someone manually goes in and changes it. All right? Some of you I see here had CISS 16 uh, from me in, uh, in the summer. All right, some of you had it, you know, last spring and maybe even prior to that. If you go back, if you still have those homeworks and you pulled up your first assignment for that class, it's going to look exactly like the day that you submitted it. All right, it's a static page. It doesn't change unless you go in and manually make the change. Now, the web server's job in a static environment is to simply find the HTML and other files and send them to the client. The analogy I often use um, is that the server in this case does what a server in McDonald's does. All right? If you go into McDonald's and order a Big Mac and fries, what does the server do? Goes to the bin where the Big Macs are, finds a Big Mac, gives it to you, finds a bag of fries and gives it to you. In other words, the stuff is pre-made. It's sitting there waiting for someone to ask for it. And all the server does is find it and delivers it. Okay. Now, you realize when I talk about HTML that there's actually more that the client uh, can get in addition to just plain old HTML. Actually, they can get HTML or XHTML. They can also get CSS code delivered to them.
The third thing that they can get delivered to them is JavaScript. And we'll save this one for a minute. Let's just for now talk about HTML and CSS. HTML provides the content for the page. The logical structure for the page. CSS supplies the code for the appearance of the page. And also the physical layout. To the degree that we can keep those two things separate, our website will be way more flexible. All right. We gain tons of flexibility by keeping those two things very separate. By having our code separated and have the HTML contain the content and logical structure and the CSS contain the appearance. Why do I say that? What do I mean by keeping those two things separate? And what sort of flexibility do you get? Anyone care to, to comment on that? Very good. One of the, the, the easiest, um, easiest, easiest to see advantages is that if you use CSS to control the appearance of your site, you can have all your code relating to the appearance in a single file. All right? And therefore, if you decide to change something about your site, that is change the font, change the colors, change the physical layout, all you have to do is change the CSS and every page on, on that site reflects that change. So in the old days, you know, if you wanted to change the font, you might have to go into every page individually and change the font in a bunch of places. All right. Whereas with this, conceivably one change could change the font on every single web page in, in a single file. You'll see this a lot in, in all sorts of forms of software development, is that you have these components that they each do their job. They, to be sure, they have to talk to each other somehow. But to the degree that you can keep them separate, you gain flexibility. It's like, and again, I'm, I'm gonna, gonna date myself here, all right? It's like the old stereo systems compared to the old Victrolas or hi-fi sets where everything was built into one thing, you know. Back when I was a kid, they'd be like, this was your stereo, and it was just this boom. And there were speakers attached to it, and there was a radio attached to it, and there was a turntable attached to it, and so on. All right? Guess what? If one thing went bad, what'd you do? Pitch the whole thing and buy a new one, right? Um, if you liked the way that the, turn, if the turntable worked fine, but you wanted better speakers, you're out of luck because everything was just one sort of unit. All right? Compare that to the modularization that you'll see now, where you have separate speakers, separate, not, not that too many people have turntables, but maybe a CD player or an MP3 player or whatever. If I go and I change from, um, one MP3 player to another, do I have to get a whole new set of stereo equipment? No, I can just plug the old one into the new speakers and everything will work okay. All right? That's the idea with this, keeping things as components. That gives you a lot more flexibility of how things go. All right? So, here is the scenario in static web pages. The server asks, oh, I'm sorry, the client asks for something and the server responds to it by finding the files that are relevant and delivering them to the client. Now the problem with static web pages is that they really don't provide the functionality that we've come to expect from the web. All right? Most websites today have at least some content which is not static, but which is dynamic. All 
Static means not changing, at least not without human intervention. Dynamic means that it's changing. Let me give you a, a for instance, something that a couple of sites that we're all familiar with. If we go to Angel, if I go and I click on the link for Angel and I go to it, here I am, I'm typing in, I'm, I'm the client and I'm making my request to the server that makes its way through the internet finds Angel's server, Angel thinks about it and sends me a response. I now go and I enter in a user ID and password. And up pops a page made just for me. All right. If you did the exact same thing, your page would look different than this. Why? Because you're registered in different classes. Um, I got a report today. Um, I think there is like right around 13,000 students attending classes at LC this semester. Right around 13,000. Does that mean that someone over in distance learning went and made 13,000 HTML pages, one for each student, keeping track of what courses they have and all that? That's ridiculous. It's far-fetched. Uh, something like that would not be workable. Um, another example, you know, my favorite website, Google. I type in PHP and I get search results for PHP. I type in JavaScript and I get the results for that. Now clearly, they couldn't have a bunch of web pages preformed out there waiting for someone to ask for them. The McDonald's model doesn't work for this. They can't have a bunch of those pages sitting out there. Oh, here, where, you know, oh, they wanted Google for PHP. Okay, here, you know, it just doesn't work. All right? Amazon, eBay, any of these systems that offer greater functionality typically are going to be dynamic pages. What does that mean? That means that the server has a harder job. All right? The server isn't like at McDonald's where their only job is to find what you asked for and give it to you. The server's job is to actually make it on the fly. And the example I often give for this is if you go to Subway and place an order. Right? If you go to Subway and place an order, what do you do? Well, you give them a rough idea what sandwich I want. I want the, uh, you know, the, what is it, the BMT, or I want the, the uh, chicken whatever sandwich or whatever. So you give them an idea of what, what you want. They know the recipe for making those. They also know that you have a bunch of options, that you might want wheat bread or white bread. You might want lettuce on it or no lettuce on it, and so on for all the different ingredients on it. In some way, why don't they just have, why don't they just do like McDonald's and have all these sandwiches out there waiting for it? Well, that's ridiculous. All the combinations that you could order, all right, a sandwich in, they couldn't possibly have them pre-made out there waiting for you. So they make it on the fly. It's exactly the same as with Angel, as with Google, with Amazon, and so on. So a Subway, the server has in mind a recipe. They have instructions on how to make a sandwich. They get input from the user regarding some of the special conditions that the, the user wants. What kind of bread, what toppings, and so on. And they go and they create a sandwich on the fly right there and deliver it to the customer. In dynamic websites, very similar thing happens. The client makes a request makes it to the internet, to the server. The server doesn't have completed HTML pages like they do here. What does the server have instead? The server has recipes for making web pages. Only they don't call them recipes in, in web programming. They call them typically scripts or programs or other names. Since we're doing PHP in this class, typically they'd be called scripts. Think of this as being the recipe.
were, um, were Angel done in PHP, which I don't think it is. I think it's an ASP um, product. But were Angel being done in PHP, then there'd be a script to say how to construct a person's home page. Not a home page specific to me, you, the next person, but instructions that say this is how you create a home page. Well, where does it get the rest of the data to fill in that home page? Well, it gets it based on user input. In other words, when I logged on to Angel, I specified my user ID and password. So it knows who I am. And it often will get some information from databases. So just like the person at Subway has all their ingredients, has their recipe, has a conversation with you to, to get some input from you, the server has the instructions to create a web page has input from you in the form of something that you typed in, in the case of, um, in the case of Google, the term I'm searching for, in the case of Angel, your username and password, and there's likely to be database storage involved, where a list of the classes that you are currently enrolled in comes back from the database based on the user ID and password you supplied. Now, when you go to the subway or when you go to McDonald's, what do you leave with in both cases? You leave with a sandwich. All right? That's important to recognize. Regardless of whether the process to create the web page is static or dynamic, the client gets delivered the same thing. One thing I always say about this is you can't eat a recipe. All right? The script doesn't do you any good. The script has to be brought to life by the web server taking your input and information from the database. And that will produce a web page for you. All right? So if I go and I did, just did a Google search for JavaScript, If I were to right mouse and say view source, it's going to be long, but in essence, I am simply viewing an HTML document. Here's a link. All right. That HTML document wasn't pre prepared and waiting for me, it was created on the fly by Google's web server by looking at what I asked for and looking in their database. Likewise, if I look at Angel. If I go and look at this, still HTML. That doesn't mean that it was sitting out there waiting for me. It was created because Angel has a script on how to make a person's page and it has the information about what classes they're taking in, uh, from the database. And lastly, it has um, the user input. One of the more dramatic ways to, to look at this is if you look at Amazon, if you look at, um, <coughs> wow, that's a first. I was about ready to panic. If we look at a number of products, we can almost see a template, all right? Whereas just individual pieces of this vary depending on the specific product that we're looking at. Notice that this navigation is the same when we go from product to product. But the picture is a picture of the specific product that we're looking at. Special offers, frequently bought, customers have bought this, often bought that, product details. If we go and look at some other product, notice if it's the same structure. Really, that recipe, that script that the server has, 
essentially has some HTML which is static, that is never changes, and it sort of fills in the blank with some of this dynamic stuff that it pulls from the database. Okay, the last thing on our, uh, there, there's two more things that we want to talk about. One I'll talk about today, one we will save to Wednesday. You see, I watch too much TV and movies. I always try to leave, like, leave a cliffhanger like, to keep you coming back the next time. Like, I'll just about be, be telling you the secret and you know, someone, Huffman's voice will come from out in the hall. Tune in Wednesday to find out how Ajax works or something like that. At any rate, the last thing that we are going to consider is the role of JavaScript. Actually, we'll talk about this for a minute uh, and, and we'll finish this up on Wednesday as well. So we'll talk about JavaScript and Ajax on Wednesday. The idea of JavaScript is like this. All right. Actually, I'll tell you what. We'll, we'll talk about JavaScript on Wednesday. I don't want to get started because we only have a couple minutes left. Let's look at your first lab that's due. Um, One of the great things about working in web development is that if you're working in, in a web environment, chances are you're connected to the internet. And if you're connected to the internet, chances are there are um, whatever topic you're working on, there's a lot of resources available for it. You know? And I rely on resources constantly. You know? I don't have every single instruction on, in every language I've ever worked in memorized. Yeah, I remember the things I do most often, right? the things I've done a million times, but the things that maybe I don't do quite as often or it's been a while since I did it, I've got to look it up just like anyone else. That's okay. And, and, and the internet is so powerful and puts so many things at your fingertips that I have a feeling that's the way a lot of people work these, these, these days. All right? Your first assignment is to find resources about the three main topics uh, in this class. And the three main topics are this, JavaScript, PHP, and Ajax. All right. So those are the three main topics uh, uh, of the course. And I want you to find some resources. And I differentiate between a resource, which is something that gives you some background information, and a reference, something that you might just use as a quick look up to, you know, where does the dot go in that statement, you know, that sort of thing. But I want you to find two references and two resources about each of these topics. So it would be a total of 12 websites, four about each of the topics. Then I want you to create a web page that you could put up for members of this class to help them solve their problems. In other words, gee, they have a JavaScript problem. The reference that you should give should possibly give them some guidance on how to solve that problem. They, uh, a student wants to know background about, a, uh, about what Ajax is. You should give them a resource that describes what Ajax is and a little bit of how it works and so on. Now, I don't expect you to understand everything that you find, right? The whole purpose of this class is for us to, to understand PHP and JavaScript and Ajax. So I don't expect you for everything to be perfectly clear, but I think you should at least be able to tell on a conceptual level what some of these things are about. So I want you to find these resources and references, read about them, summarize them in your own words, and then create your own web page. All right? I want you to show off your HTML and CSS skills in this. So make the web page look good. All right? Consider your audience, the other people in this class. Make the page look good. Follow good guidelines as far as creating HTML and CSS code. All right? And create a page that, that is well designed. All right? I give similar assignments to this in almost all my classes because one thing it reinforces, it gives me an opportunity to talk about the use of resources, which, which can't be underestimated. All right? And it also gives a nice easy way to sort of ease into some of these topics and at least get you sort of an overview of them uh, before we dive into them. 
Now, on Wednesday, I'm going to talk about JavaScript in more detail, and we'll talk about Ajax, and then the overture will be over, and we'll start Act 1. All right, we'll see you over in lab.